So good morning to everybody. Uh, this is Hall B, uh, day three of KOS, and uh, we are going to have a session on retinal vascular uh, uh, diseases. We have our chairperson, Dr. Kalpana, with us, and uh, Dr. Kalpana is a professor of uh, uh, and HOD of Vitro Retina from uh, Minto Eye Hospital. And we have uh, Dr. Venkat Subramaniam. He is the director of Ranglakshmi Netralia. Our uh, first talk is going to be from Dr. Sanjay Srinivasan. He is going to talk us. Talk to us on COVID and retinal vascular occlusion. He's a, a consultant UVA at Nara Netralia. Can we have the first talk, please? So what yes. we can do is we can have all talks because I think we'll be running tight. And then at the end of uh, all the uh, talks, we can have question on the session. Yeah. So I would request speakers yeah. to hold on till the end of the session. Thank you. Yeah. Kindly put up the first talk, please. Good morning, everybody. I would like to thank uh, Karnataka Ophthalmologic Society and uh, Dr. Ilan Kumar and uh, Dr. Sri Bhargava for allowing me to share my uh, experiences with uh, COVID and uh, uh, retinal vascular occlusions. So, retinal vascular occlusions have become uh, more common in the post-COVID-19 era. Uh, my outline of the talk would be post-COVID-19 uh, retinal vascular manifestations, its pathogenesis, and uh, our experiences. Uh, this study was approved by Narayanetara Ethics Committee. Uh, imaging and ocular sample collections was approved by the study. Patients return and informed consent was obtained for the inclusion in the study. I do not have any financial disclosures. The most important thing for pathogenesis of the coronavirus is the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. This actually binds to the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 and enters the cell through two processes. One is endocytosis uh, and catepsin L-dependent viral escape from the endosome, which is augmented by the transmembrane serine protease 2. The spike protein has uh, two components, the S1 component, which is uh, uh, having a receptor binding domine, which engages with the ACE2 receptor and the NTT2, NTD, uh, which facilitates the attachment factors. I'll show you a small video clip of the coronavirus, how it actually enters into the human cell. So this coronavirus has this uh, spike proteins, uh, which is uh, responsible for the COVID-19 disease. There is also a subunit, S2, which helps in viral host fusion. So, as I mentioned, the spike protein is the most important thing. Spike, it's a corona in Latin. So, it has a membrane protein, an envelope protein, So when the spike protein actually attaches to the cell, the host cell actually helps the spike protein to actually enter into the uh, human cell. So it is cleaved by the furin enzyme of the host cell. So that is the cleaving which happens. Next happens the fusion with the S2 subunit and the coronavirus enters into the cell which binds to the S2 protein. So, A2 protein is uh, present in lung, kidneys, arteries, and also in the uh, blood vessels. It is also present in the retina. So, once the fusion happens by endocytosis, the spike, uh, the uh, nuclear material enters into the human cell and starts directing the uh, human cell to produce the viral RNA. So the viral RNA and the viral proteins are generated by the human cell and they are assembled and it was infection in the human cell. So this is more important in uh, view of the newer uh, Omicron strain where the uh, S protein has uh, had uh, 30 mutations. So how does our body respond? Our body responds by either innate immunity by generating interferons or by adaptive immunity by uh, producing antibodies. 
in the human body there is also what is known as molecular mimicry where there is a anti uh, viral immune response which can have a pro inflammatory environment leading to release of self antigens from the damaged tissue so this can actually cause uh, occlusion of the vessels and also there is a concept called bystander activation where self antigens are attacked by the body's proteins uh, through the antigen presenting cells triggering autoimmunity there are many auto antibodies found in sars cov2 which include anti uh, 52k ssa ro ss uh, 60k ssa ro anti nuclear antibody anti phospholipid antibodies anti anti cardiolipin iga anti b2 glycoprotein iga and igg so how does uh, hypercoagulation happen in covid 19 so there is an increase in the inflammatory markers which causes endothelitis which in, uh, activates the complement pathway and also the extrinsic coagulation pathway this causes platelet activation and clot formation this process can happen in the retinal vessels also the ace2 receptor causes increase in angiotensin 2 which also causes vasoconstriction and increased tf3 and plasminogen activator inhibition so this also causes a hypercoagulable state so vascular occlusions uh, can have a different uh, form in uh, the eye uh, depending on uh, whether it is a mild moderate or severe so you can have vasculitis occlusion papillophlebitis crvo crvo amn uh, in uh, different forms so this is one of the articles uh, which we had uh, published uh, this patient had uh, post covid and had a single cotton wool spot This is another 51 year old female uh, who was a known diabetic but no other diabetic manifestations has cotton wool spots and uh, also has a retinitis patch as indicated by the inner retinal swelling and the cotton wool spot near the blood vessel on the OCT This is an interesting case of a 26 year old male who had a retinal detachment in the other eye presented with a blurring of vision 2 uh, months after covid infection um you can see here hyperreflective area in the outer uh, plexiform layer with a uh, superior nasal defect this patient had high uh, d dimer serum ferritin and uh, he was treated with uh, oral ecospray one of the interesting features what we found out in the multicolor imaging which probably uh, has not been proven yet is the loss of this uh, foveal ring around the in the pseudo color image Uh, this is the FFE of the patient. There was a slight delay of uh, arm retinal time of uh, 24 seconds, but other than that, uh, the FFE is uh, featureless. And uh, this is the uh, post uh, one month uh, treatment with ecospin. You can see that the hyperreflectivity has resolved, and uh, the field defect is almost uh, gone now. and uh, the foveal reflex which i was mentioning to you earlier at presentation uh, which was lost is uh, regained here this is a 72 year old uh, female who developed a branch uh, retinal vein occlusion more of a hemicentral uh, retinal vein occlusion uh, two months after covid she had no systemic uh, risk factors This is one of the other uh, publications we have had a patient with uh, CRVGO, but uh, he had uh, mild elevated uh, homocysteine. Other than that, uh, he had no other risk factors. So he had uh, inner retinal uh, swelling. This is another case of a patient who developed uh, blurring of vision four days after discharge from the hospital uh, during the first wave. He had uh, central retinal uh, artery occlusion in one eye and. Uh, Uh, cotton wool spots in the other eye you can see the inner retinal uh, swelling with a lot of uh, posterior uh, hyperreflective uh, spots and uh, the left <coughs> left eye shows uh, cystoid changes and uh, posterior hyperreflective spots so this uh, we have published uh, uh, in a patient uh, with panuviatus with optic neuritis and also central retinal artery occlusion uh importantly we have to look at the systemic markers uh, which are the interleukin 6 crp ferritin fibrinogen and d dimer these can be increased in uh, cases of uh, vascular occlusions so if they are increased they imply a prothrombotic uh, state and a hypercoagulable uh, state uh 
uh, we have done a study looking at these factors and in our uh, series uh, we have found that uh, those who have uh, severe ophthalmic manifestations can have uh, raised uh, systemic markers another case which we have uh, published is a patient who was uh, treated as a post fever retinitis uh, with the steroids steroids mind you can uh, cause a procoagulant uh, state so before treating any post fever retinitis always uh, rule out a uh, covid-19 infection so this patient uh, so subsequently after being treated with uh, steroids developed uh, vascular occlusions and also systemic uh, vasculitic uh, features of uh, petechial rashes and uh, the vasculitis was uh, quite uh, extensive with uh, vascular occlusions after being treated with anticoagulants and aspirin the patient actually recovered this is the timeline of events uh, the patient uh, had retinitis uh, suspected the post uh, dengue and uh, was uh, treated then even the chikungunya was uh, positive so at this point the patient started developing occlusion so here the oral aspirin and uh, doxycycline was given then the steroids were uh, restarted along with the subcutaneous enoxaparin then the patient had a resolution as shown in this picture so i'll be showing you some uh, graphic images this patient developed uh, uh, extensive systemic vasculitis including nasal gangrene gangrene of the pinna um, gangrene in the ankle and also gangrene of the finger post covid one month later so right eye uh, he had uh, high fema and left eye he had uh, vitreous hemorrhage and uh, this is uh, post treatment where uh, uh, we started him on uh, steroids and immunosuppression and also cyclophosphamide uh, which resulted in uh, resolution of the lesion so this is the right eye which uh, had a complete high fema which resolved completely uh, subsequently we did uh, pan retinal photocoagulation both eyes so uh, just because it is occurring after covid it is not uh, attributable to covid so we have to prove that uh, there are no other risk factors which has uh, caused this uh, vascular occlusion uh, we have published all this uh, features in our uh, review article on a posterior segment manifestation including the imaging so in conclusion covid can cause hypercoagulable states our series adds that uh, site threatening manifestations are a distinct uh, possibility post covid anticoagulants must be started early recognition and management improves the chance of visual outcome so we have uh, reached the end of 2021 now at 2022 we are having more and more uh, occlusions uh, following uh, vaccination so we'll have to keep this in mind and treat accordingly so picture abhi bhi baki hai mera dost thank you very much so i'd like to thank you for the opportunity if there are any questions i'll be happy to answer thank you thanks sanjay uh, that was a excellent talk and uh, the graphics were very very amazing so if time permits probably we can come back to you with uh, questions so i would request dr Ven uh, ramesh venkatesh to present his talk and uh, let us keep to our timings of 8 minutes uh, dr ramesh is uh, uh, a consultant at naran netralia with a special interest in imaging and macular disorders over to you dr ramesh so retinal telangiectasias are abnormal leaky blood vessels and depending on their location they can be classified into macular or elsewhere and in macular you have what is the congenital or the coats uh, macular coats disease or the aneurysmal mactal and at the acquired variety you have the more classical exudative mactal or the idiopathic uh, <laughs> juxtafoveal telangiectasia and you have a type 3 which is called as the occlusive telangiectasia which is a very rare entity so the gas and body basically divide and mactal into three groups the type 1 being the aneurysmal variety type 2 being the peripheral and the type 3 being occlusive and yanusi further simplified it saying that the occlusive is very rare so why keep it and just uh, classify them into type 1 and type 2 so gas and body further classified the type 2 disease into five stages uh, starting from the presence of uh, peripheral graying and uh, and, <laughs> and uh, with further with no minimal or no visible telangiectic vessels stage 3 being the right angle venules stage 4 being pigment hyperplasia and pigment plaques and stage 5 being a uh, neovascular membrane and yanusi further simplified this and said that we don't need so many stages we just need two stages non proliferative and proliferative variety 
So there's always a debate what occurs first, whether it is the uh, neurodegenerate neuronal degeneration in MACTL which occurs first, or is it the vascular lesions which ha happen first? And let's understand this, that the clinical features in MACTL is basically a combination of both the neurodegenerative process, which is due to the involvement of the Muller cells and the vascular process, which is because of the abnormal telangiectic vessels. There are a few diseases, systemic diseases, which predispose to MACTL and the most important being diabetes mellitus. And the reason why it is because diabetes affects the Muller cells and Muller cells, they are form an important part of the inner blood retinal barrier. And when there is damage to the Muller cells uh, because of diabetes, there is breakdown of the inner blood, blood retinal barrier and the structural support to the blood capillaries are lost. So the probable sequence of events which happen in MACTEL is that you have systemic diseases like diabetes and hypertension, which cause Muller cell damage. There is a loss of the structural support to the capillaries, breakdown in the blood retinal barrier. There is a development of the telangiectic vessels and increased leakage from those capillaries, and that leads to MACTEL. So what we believe is that the neuronal degeneration occurs uh, prior to the vascular involvement. But this recent paper showed something very different because they looked at the vascular changes on the OCT angiography in patients who did not have any features of, uh, of uh, structural changes on the OCT. And they found that the vascular changes, they occur much earlier and they can be identified on the OCT angiography. Now, these are a few clinical features in MACTEL type 2. You have the periphoveal hyper, uh, periphoveal graying or the, and the loss of retinal transparencies, pigment flux, superficial retinal crystals and the neovascularization, right angle venules and the pigment plug. Now, what, uh, this is something very important because easily PFT can be missed on clinical examination. And what I did is I just looked at my clinical cases where I tried and picked up clinic, uh, clinically whether I could pick up PFT or not. And <laughs> I realized that in 19, I could pick up PFT only in 19 of those 28 cases. And the mistake was as much as 32%. So we need to understand why we miss uh, MACTEL on clinical examination, and that is because of the concept of bleaching, where there is, because of the light, there is a bleaching of the lutein and the zeaxanthin pigment, which makes the identification very difficult. So this is a paper which talks about the changes uh, following dark adaptation and bleaching on the blue reflectance imaging in macular telangiectasia. And let me show you one case of a unilateral MACTEL. This is a 67-year-old male hypertensive, comes for regular checkup, visual activity of 6.8 in the right eye and 6.6 in the left. And what you find in the right eye is the presence of hyperreflectance with um, a, a whitening and some few yellowish retinal crystals, whereas the left eye does not show anything on clinical examination. So the blue reflectance image shows the <laughs> classical hyperreflectance which we described, whereas the left eye hardly shows any changes. The autofluorescence again shows the loss of the hypoautofluorescence on the macula foveal region, whereas the left eye looks normal. The OCT of the right eye is classically showing the ILM drape sign and the inner retinal hyperreflective spaces, whereas the left eye is normal. And what you realize on the FA, this is the most important because the FA is the classical uh, gold standard tool for imaging uh, PFTs. And you can see the perifoveal hyperfluorescence in the right eye, but not in the left eye. Again, the OCTA confirms that this is a unilateral disease. So you can have unilateral diseases with type 2 MACTL. Now let's understand the uh, disease progression. So you basically have five stages, stage 1 to 2 and 3. And from 3 onwards, it can either go directly to stage 5 or it goes follows a process of stage 4 and stage 5. Understand the OCT features in paraphobial telangiectasias. You basically divide these features into two groups, the inner retinal findings and the outer retinal findings, the most earliest one being the splaying of the foveal contour, followed by the hyperreflectivity in the middle retinal layers, the ILM drape sign, and then you have the outward bending of the inner retinal layers. This is a very important feature which is being seen on the OCT in advanced cases. Now let's look at the outer retinal changes. <laughs> you have the pigment plaque formation and the presence of the uh, outer cavitations, then you have the migration of the pigment plaques, development of subretinal neovascularization, pre-proliferative disease with retinoretinal anastomosis and retinochoroidal anastomosis. Fundus autofluorescence in PFT, it shows the characteristics, lo characteristic loss of perifoveal autofluorescence uh, due to the loss of the macular pigments in the early stages and also helps in the identification of the subretinal neovascularization. Now, the, the, because of the pigment plaques, you can have the blockage of the autofluorescent signal as well. So these are the few images which describes the various findings on autofluorescence in MACTEL. And this paper compares the autofluorescence and the multicolor imaging and where 
the multicolor imaging outscores the uh, uh, autofluorescence finding in the diagnosis of macular telangiectasia. Well, how important is fluorescein in uh, PFT? PF fluorescein is the gold standard in the diagnosis of PFT. And when do we do it? We do it when the diagnosis of PFT is in doubt, like what I showed you in a case of unilateral PFT, and when you are suspecting a neovascular process. So this is a patient where you have a, <laughs> a clear-cut uh, diagnosis of PFT in the left eye, but the right eye shows a very early hypo, uh, hyperfluorescence, which is suggestive of a stage one disease. Whereas the subretinal neovascularization, you can see this focal and diffuse kind of hyperfluorescence, which is very classical in a macular neovascularization. Multicolor imaging, is it an alternative? Yes, it is an alternative which is used for the diagnosis of, um, uh, of MACTEL and multicolor imaging. This is our paper uh, on multicolor imaging in macular telangiectasia, where it tells you that you can identify all the stages of MACTEL on the multicolor imaging. And coming to this, the blue reflectance is useful to tell you the extent of the involvement, the loss of retinal transparency and the development of retinal crystals. The green reflectance talks about the right angled vessel dipping. The IR image talks about the pigment blocks and the subretinal neovascularization and therefore the multicolor. It talks about all the features of MACTEL on multicolor. <clears throat> OCT angiography and on in PFT, very important tool nowadays, where you can see... Will you be able to conclude yeah. in next... This yeah, Saturday. I will conclude, sir. So basically, OCT angiography is very important. It helps you in diagnosing all the uh, vascular changes and the uh, structural changes which is being seen on the uh, uh, in the disease. And visual acuity in MACTEL is hardly affected in the early stages. Most of the cases have good vision. And these are a few newer concepts where you can have, uh, based on the MACTEL area, you can correlate with the visual acuity and the pre-proliferative stage, which we described very recently uh, in a few cases. And then you have a type 3 MACTEL where it is considered now to be a follow-up of the type 2 disease itself. And lastly, <laughs> we would want to just show a case of epiretinal neovascularization where you can see on the OCT angiography, a case of epiretinal neovascularization is seen in mac macular telangiectasia. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Ramesh. Wonderful set of cases and uh, such a wonderful update on uh, uh, cases that we see routinely. Uh, I would like to invite uh, the next talk, Dr. Venkat Subramaniam, and he is going to talk on management of uh, retinal artery occlusion. Usha, can you put up the next talk, please, Dr. Venkat? Yes. Thank you. Uh, do we have my video? Yes, yes, sir. Can we have the next talk from uh, Dr. Karthik? Meanwhile, can we uh, have questions for uh, uh, Dr. Sanjay and uh, Dr. Uh, Ramesh? Uh, one interesting thing which I wanted to note was, uh, like, you know, uh, on fundus fluorescence, uh, autofluorescence, are you able to um, identify some of the early changes, uh, how many cases were actually, you know, missed if you probably do an autofluorescence routinely. Uh, and then also, does is there is there a place where Octa misses it? Uh, not many of us have a, a experience with Octa. Uh, does Octa ever miss uh, a PFT? Now, uh, we are all aware of the anatomy of the uh, Retinal veins, central retinal vein. They I think the presentation has started. I think the presentation is on. We can. Central retinal vein, which perforates the lamina cribrosa, traverses through the optic nerve, <coughs> and then exits the optic nerve to eventually drain either into the superior ophthalmic vein or into the cavernous sinus. RVO <coughs> is um, one of the most common retinal vascular diseases after diaptic retinopathy, and the incidence and prevalence of this disease increases with age. We are all aware of the types of RVOs. Branch retinal vein occlusion happens at the AV crossing changes uh, because of a uh, uh, thick arteriolar wall compressing on the uh, venule. Now, this can be either uh, one of the uh, major trunks involved leading to a major BRBO or a tributary involved leading to a minor BRBO. Though the ischemia is not much in the minor BRBO, still the macular edema is similar to the uh, macular edema that happens in. Uh, major BRBO. CRBOs and hemi CRBOs can be ischemic and non ischemic. Uh, how do we differentiate between the two? The visual acuity is better in the ischemic, in the non ischemic variety. RAPD is more pronounced in the ischemic variety compared to the non ischemic variety. But the most important test is 
uh, the ERG where there is a reduction in the B wave amplitude of more than 60% to 80% of the ischemic variety. Fundus findings are not relevant. This is given by an example given by Harry. This left side fundus picture looks like an ischemic CRVO, but when an um, ERG was done, there was not a significant reduction in the B wave amplitude, and this patient spontaneously improved. Uh, improved in a course of uh, two years. So fundus findings uh, categorizing the CRVOs either ischemic or non-ischemic based upon the fundus findings is not relevant. FFA is necessary to quantify the amount of ischemia. Histopathological studies have been performed on patients whose eyes were enucleated and it has been demonstrated that recanalization of thrombus happens any time from one to five years after the onset of disease. This also means to say that we have to uh, handle the complications of CRBO for this period, uh, following which the vein may recanalize and perfusion may uh, establish. So what are the risk factors for RBO? Hypertension is a major risk factor for both uh, the RBO and CRBO. It is more than patients over older than 50 or 60 years of age. Diab in diabetics, ischemic CRBO is more common. Dyslipidemia is more common in younger patients. Hypothyroid can lead to dyslipidemia, apart from this, smoking, dehydration, and glaucoma are the other risk factors. Uh, blood coagulopathies, which include uh, homocysteinemia, protein C proteinase deficiencies, uh, factor V laden, uh, can lead to uh, CRVO in younger patients. OCP use is also associated with it. How do we investigate? Uh, OCT is one of the most commonest uh, investigations that we do. Now, we are all aware of the OCT picture of a PRVO. Uh, let us look at what the biomarkers are. Biomarkers for OCT include uh, HRF, DRIL, PAM, and uh, ANG, and the others. Uh, HRF are hyperreflective foci. Uh, these tend to accumulate in the outer plexiform layer uh, in BRVOs and CRVOs, unlike DMEs, where they accumulate around fluid. And the presence of hyperreflective foci in the outer retina layers is a good prognosis for treatment. Now, presence of drill at baseline is a first. Uh, usually, patients have worser visual activity. Similarly, when patients uh, who are on antibiotic th therapy improve, uh, the drill improves, then they have better prognosis. Now, PAM and PMLM have been described. Now, uh, this is a prominent middle laminatic membrane. And the PAM is hyperreflectivity within the uh, middle layers of the uh, neural retina. Now, both of these imply uh, ischemia of the uh, neural retina, and such patients, after the edema subsides, there is usually atrophy of the neural retina and limited visual recovery. The other investigations that are performed are OTA, uh, which is known to, uh, which is uh, used to know the uh, density of the plexus, also to look at uh, the enlargement and disruption of the pars, CNP areas, NVs and NVVs. FFA is used basically to quantify the amount of ischemia. ERG is also used for the same. Ultrasound is used when there is a uh, dense cataract of the TSFH. How do we treat? Now, lasers are were used and are also used limitedly in uh, retinal vein occlusion. Are had mentioned that uh, uh, that after the, the the possibility of neovascularization dramatically decreases after the first seven months after the onset of disease, and it is not necessary that all patients with NVA and NVA uh, do progress to NVG. Now um, the incidence of happening neovascularization has significantly come down after the introduction of antibiotic in the treatment of uh, CF, uh, RVOs. Now in the central retinal vein occlusion. Uh, a capillary non-perfusion of more than this diameter categorizes the patients to have ischemic uh, CRVO. Such patients need to be followed up on a monthly basis to look for uh, NVIs and NVAs. And uh, in case they do develop, then photocoagulation should be promptly photocoagulation uh, should be promptly administered to prevent them to getting into these complications. Now, similarly, in BRVO, anything more than five. This diameters of CNP areas categorizes them as ischemic and such patients should also be monitored. In case the patients do not comply for frequent follow-ups, then prophylactic laser may be administered for them. Now, grid laser can, was used for BRV and is still used for BRVO, 
mostly as a rescue therapy. Now, for administering grid laser, the patient should have a visual acuity lesser than 6.1. Uh, we should at least wait for three to six months to see for to look for resolution of uh, macular edema and also to help in clearing the retinal hemorrhages. A good FFA uh, is necessary in uh, prior to a grid laser to look for perfused macula uh, with a leakage. Now, steroids are used extensively in the treatment of RBOs. Most of the studies have uh, shown uh, good uh, results with uh, steroids. Uh, the only concern is the uh, associated risks of glaucoma and uh, cataract. Now, the, uh, the, this become a choice of therapy for patients who have had previous history of uh, cardiovascular or cerebrovascular accident, in patients who have recalcitrant edema, and for patients and for pseudopicates. In cases re repeated uh, osodex is required, it is known that the functional efficacy of this medication reduces with time, though the structure may be maintained. Ranuzumab has been studied extensively in RPOs. The Bravo and Cruz trials both um, uh, administered monthly ranuzumab for six months followed by PRN. These patients fared significantly better uh, when compared to the sham injection in uh, both the groups. However, in the RVO group, uh, the patients had a spontaneous study improvement in their visual acuity, which was not seen in the CRVO group, and the, CR, the vision improved only after administering the anti-visive therapy. Now, these patients were also followed up uh, in the Horizon and Retain uh, trial for up to four years. And what is to be known is that these patients continue to need anti-visive injections but the frequency of the injection slowly reduces as the years progress. Now, is there a PRN can be the PRN is given only after a loading dose uh, of six to seven injections, which are given in the initial uh, monthly intervals. Aflibercept is a fusion protein, which is known to uh, neutralize all isoforms of VEGF and the placental growth factor and also has a longer half-life and uh, longer half-life. It has been studied extensively in the vibrant and vibrant uh, Copernic, Copernicus and the Galileo trials, which in which there were six four-weekly injections uh, were given. In both the groups, the uh, patients did better compared to the uh, standard of care. Now, uh, amongst the anti-vigil and steroids, um, the, st the anti have uh, shown to have significantly higher uh, BCVA uh, at the end of third month in the Comrade trials. In the uh, Ranidex trial, uh, there was no statistically significant difference in the visual acuity gain between Ranibizumab and the steroids. So, steroids uh, to summarize, antibiotics in RBO management to summarize, uh, it should be started whenever there is macular edema. Uh, it is nice to wait for about a month uh, prior to initializing the treatment to look for spontaneous resolution. There is a loading dose of six injections, unlike the EMA and uh, AMD, where the loading doses is of three injections. Uh, the uh, criteria to retreat is about 250 macular edema more than 250 microns, or vision acuity lesser than six months. Now, combination therapy has also been tried, but there has been no significant benefit and uh, has been proven in administering both anti vegf and uh, steroids. Uh, systemic therapy has to be administered to control the systemic risk and a patient should be referred to an internist uh, for evaluation of coagulation disorders. Antiplatelet anticoagulants have uh, no role, there is no role of hemodilation as well. So surgical management is for patients who develop ERMs, vitreous hemorrhage, vitreous macular fraction, VPTs and TRDs. In case of recalcitrant glaucoma, the patient may require a trapper. So, is there, uh, before we conclude, is there any benefit in switching from anti to steroid? Yes, there are trials which show that switching from anti to steroid improves the visual acuity and central macular thickness in patients who are recalcitrant to anti -vigif. However, switching back from steroid to anti reduces the central macular thickness in the first month, but there is no improvement in the visual acuity. So, I again thank KOS for this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, that was a very comprehensive review of uh, vascular occlusions, uh, Dr. Karthik and uh, Venkat. Uh, can we move to the next uh, talk? 
Yeah, can is my can you read play my video, Usha? I think we have the talk from Dr. Kareem. Thank you, Dr. Kareem Society and Dr. Ellen Kumar for giving me this opportunity to be the part of this particular program. I'll be talking on retinal vasculitis and its management. Let me share the screen. Retinal vasculitis is an isolated condition or a complication of a local or systemic inflammatory disorders characterized by the inflammation of the retinal vessels. Site patterning condition, which is associated with various infective, autoimmune, inflammatory, or neoplastic disorders. To summarize the entire spectrum of clinical manifestation, what we see in retinal vasculitis, this particular fundus photograph shows a uh, kind of a the retinal vasculitis is not only associated with the inflammation of the retinal artery or the retinal veins, there can be associated massive exudation, as in this particular photograph, or there could be an associated retinitis. There could be associated retinal hemorrhages. There could be also inflammatory edemas, which are seen in addition to the plain vasculitis. Retinal vasculitis predominantly involves the different kinds of blood vessels. It could be the larger vessel blood disease, medium vessel disease, or a small vessel disease. Large vessel disease predominantly are Takayasu's arthritis or giant cell arthritis. There can be medium vessel disease, something like a M microscopic polyangiitis or an MPA or a GPA, granulomatous poly polyangiitis or the Schrockstrauss kind of a disease. Or there could be associated other medium vessel vasculitis like polyarthritis known as or Kawasaki disease. This is predominantly describes the systemic involvement in, so this involve, involves predominantly the systemic vasculitis that is associated with the retinal vasculitis. The clinical spectrum of retinal vasculitis, what we see include, there could be a presence of a skip vasculitis. Skip vasculitis predominantly involves a small amount of uh, vasculitis, uh, which spares the other blood vessels. There could be involvement in a small amount of disease, a small amount of retinal vessels. Kindly note the tortuosity of the retinal veins in this particular photograph. There is also an associated uh, retinal uh, retinitis patch sub uh, vascular retinitis patch as in seen in this particular fundus photograph. Or it could be a confluent retinal vasculitis or it could be a presence of a frosted branch angiitis. Frosted branch angiitis represent a spectrum of severe retinal vasculitis which involves the entire length of the vessel, a thickened kind of a vessel wall with the infiltrate of a lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate uh, predominantly seen in either systemic vasculitis or an infective vasculitis or it could also be seen as a part of a malignancy. Hemorrhagic vasculitis as seen in this particular photograph is associated with uh, patches of whitish patches along the spread of the blood vessels associated with the hemorrhages. A typical vasculitis pattern which is called as a chiralis vasculitis wherein we see endoluminal infiltrates and associated perivascular infiltrates as well. So this is a typical vasculitis which we see in toxoplasma retinitis associated vasculitis. Another type is an occlusive vasculitis as described in Takayasu's arthritis wherein it is a hypovolemic vasculitis, hypoflow vasculitis. Kindly note the absence of a retinitis, absence of hemorrhages, absence of exudation in this particular photograph. The infectious uh, kind of a vasculitis is predominantly we see described in the bacterial types are in tuberculosis and syphilis and parasitic is in toxoplasmosis. Viral predominantly we see in CMV retinitis and the herpetic group of uh, viruses. Fungal we predominantly see in candidiasis. Systemic vasculitis which is associated with the non-infectious kind of a retinal vasculitis include uh, systemic lupus erythematosus and polyarthritis nodosa. Masquerades like lymphoma and leukemias are also associated and other important systemic disease which we see here is Bessette's disease and sarcoidosis. The important clinical clues, when there is a presence of a subvascular pigmented choreoretinal atrophy and an associated of a broad spectrum, broad based aposteocyanica, tubercular uveitis becomes the etiology of choice. Whereas when there is a unifocal retinitis with there is no hemorrhages, and predominantly presence of vitritis and a neurosensory detachment in the presence of the pigmented scar, oxoplasma becomes the most commonest differential diagnosis. Unifocal retinitis that is associated with hemorrhages with no vitritis in an immunocompromised individual, the differential diagnosis becomes CMV retinitis. Whereas in an infectious cause, when there is a presence of a mobile hypopion 
no fibrin and an absence of the genital ulcers, then the Bessage disease becomes the diagnosis of choice. Presence of a larger posterior anterior sinicae, the diffuse KPs, a pigmented inferior chororetinal spots describes the sarcoidosis. This is a spectrum of tuberculous vasculitis. Note the subvascular pigmented spots and the presence of a skip vasculitis, pigmented uh, KPs, granulomatous KPs, and the presence of disc edema describing the features of tuberculous vasculitis. Associated other tubercular features are also noted. In sarcoidosis, we kindly note the filiform sinicae, the peripheral anterior sinicae, the tented peripheral anterior sinicae, and you see the inferior distribution of the chorioretinal spots and the systemic associations of sarcoidosis. In the besets, we see the mobile hypopion with the lack of fibrin and a firm pattern kind of a vasculitis, what we see in the fundus. Associated systemic uh, features like uh, after ulceration and genital ulceration and other manifestations are also seen. Agnes granulomatis has a typical other features like that of presence of scleritis and the digital gangrene or nasal bleeds. Agnesis arteritis kindly note the presence of an avascularity in the fundus, presence of a new vascularization and the presence of florid kind of a new vascularization and feeble pulses in the peripheries, particularly of the upper limbs. The difference of the blood pressure between the upper and the lower limbs of more than 10 millimeters in the presence of a bruy of the subclavian artery or the aorta and the claudication of the extremities describes the systemic signs of Pachyasus arteritis. Systemic lupus erythematosus has its own butterfly rash, cutaneous changes, oral ulcerations, and systemic renal, CNS, and hematological manifestations can present with a combined vascular occlusion. Kindly note the presence of a darker blood column and the kind of a retinal occlusion that is seen with the systemic lupus erythematosus, which can have a combined arterial and the venous occlusions. To summarize, when there is a presence of a retinitis in the presence of a focal retinitis and a retinitis lesion, think of an all infectious cause. In the presence of a choroiditis, look for a tubercular cause. In the presence of an arterial involvement, in the presence of a perivascular sheathing, look for an infectious cause. And then there is no sheathing and an occlusive cause. Please then look for a non-infectious cause. Hemorrhagic vasculitis, look for tuberculosis and besets as the important cause. This is another variant of a vasculitis we see, wherein we see kind of a Y-shaped aneurysm along the arterial bifurcations, focal areas of retinitis, presence of a disc edema and a dense exudation, features suggestive of IRWAN, idiopathic retinitis, vasculitis, aneurysms and neuroretinitis. Hypopion is observed only in one third of the patient because it is very transient in a Bessette disease and there is the presence of intraretinal infiltrates. Bessettes, there is always a secondary arterial and the venous occlusion that is associated with retinal vasculitis. Tuberculosis is one other cause. And necrotizing retinitis, what we see in vasculitis, with the presence of vasculitis, no vitritis and retinal hemorrhage is a feature of uh, CMV retinitis. With the, a peripheral retinal vasculitis involving from the periphery to the pole, with the denser arteritis and a periarteritis or an arteriolitis seen in acute retinal necrosis. Syphilis presents with the ground glass appearance and this kind of a, a hypo or dense placoid lesions with the involvement in the immunocompromised patients. And the fever associated retinitis shows the exudation, presence of an exudation, presence of dense uh, arteritis, dense kind of an retinitis with hemorrhages. And it is a continuous patch and it involves in immunocompetent individuals and they are associated with minimal hard exudates as well as hemorrhages. Non infectious uh, kind of an arteritis is seen in SLE, panapali arteritis nodosa, and Takayasu's arteritis. This is a kind of a picture what we see in uh, uh, the systemic kind of associated, kindly note the associated disc pallor kind of hemorrhages what we see in them and the presence of retinal arteritis. Note the kind of a granular deposits along the venous wall that is seen in the, uh, the fundus fluorocene angiography. The vision loss is generally associated with the vitreous hemorrhages, macular ischemia, tractional retinal detachment, and retinal arterial occlusions. So based on the investigations, mostly they are of clinical diagnosis, and supportive investigations can be done for toxoplasma, CMV retinitis, post-fever kind of a retinal vasculitis, tuberculosis, and metastasis disease. However, uh, the treatment largely depends upon the specific infectious cause for toxoplasma, CMV, and the post-fever kind of retinitis. And uh, oral steroids becomes the treatment of choice, particularly when they are associated with tuberculosis. 
or sarcoidosis. Systemic investigations are negative for tuberculosis and not suggestive of uh, sarcoidosis. Then we give a treatment of uh, tuberculosis either with oral steroids and sometimes we may also have to consider uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, also other specific etiologies can be treated with these particular entities. Surgical intervention, particularly when there's a vitreous hemorrhage from a non-resolving entity or a direction of detachment. Recurring conditions have to be treated with a kind of a, a long-term therapy for toxoplasma as well as CMV retinitis. The uh, role of immunosuppression is also there, particularly when the inflammation is recurrent and we have already treated with AKT. Thank you. Thanks for a very comprehensive review of uh, vasculitis and its uh, workup, uh, Shripati. And uh, Usha, can we have Dr. Venkat's talk, please, now? Good morning. At the outside, I'd like to thank the organizing committee of KOS and the scientific chairman for this opportunity. I'll be talking to you today on the present management of central retinal artery occlusion. The prevalence of it is typically uh, uh, one per one or hundred thousand detected as early as 1859 by one graphy, which could vary from up to almost seven to ten cases per hundred thousand, increasing with increasing age. Interestingly, one particular study showed about 1.4 to 3 percent of the population having an asymptomatic retinal embolar. The classic presentation is of a sudden painless decrease in visual acuity or vision uh, field, which basically occurs in one eye suddenly over a period of few seconds. In 1 to 2 percent of the cases, there is chance of a bilateral occurrence. One of the earliest features of it could be a deep retinal whitening, is, that is something looking like a PAM, a paracentral acute middle maculopathy with inner nuclear hyperreflectivity as seen here with loss of deep capillary plexus. And these are sometimes present in conditions such as sickle cell disease or other hemoglobinopathies which progress on to a typical CRAO. A typical CRAO will have all the classic features of retinal whitening, cherry red spot, box scar segmentation, presence of a celioretinal artery in 15 to 25 percent of the cases and these are the ones where you will have a bit of visual acuity ranging from 660 to sometimes even 66. Presence of Holland Horst plaques, which could be very pathognomonic and very important in identifying them. Iris neovascularization can be present very early, yes, as early as within two weeks of onset. The pathophysiology of this condition is because of a thrombus, which occurs very close to the uh, lamina cribrosa, though the narrowest uh, portion of the central retinal artery is where it enters the dural sheath. Presence of emboli is noted in almost 25% of the cases. CRO typically produces no remarkable damage if it is present for less than 97 minutes. So any ischemia that is present from 97 minutes to almost 240 minutes leads to you to an irreversible damage. The presentation could be arthritic, typically in 4.5 to 5 percent of the cases, which is very important because these are the conditions such as giant cell arthritis, which could lead to bilateral blindness and one needs to identify and uh, diagnose this very early. The non-arthritic typical CRAO with celioretinal spare sparing will have presence of celioretinal vessels and these could be pres basically present as a single vessel or more than single vessel giving you areas which are actually spared and this could lead to a better perfusion in that area giving you a better visual acuity. Typically identified very well clinically as well as with FFA. The non-arthritic permanent CRAO could present to you with areas of retinal whitening along with disc edema along with areas of blotch and dot blot blotch hemorrhages too. Typically non-arthritic studies or non-arthritic cases wherein therein there is a suspected embolism, it has been noted that there is almost 70% of them had an ipsilateral carotid atherosclerotic plaque. Apart from a cholesterol plaque, you could have other plaques such as calcific or a fibrin plaque. It's important to rule out all the risk factors such as cigarette smoking, hypertension, lipids, diabetes, coagulopathy and do not miss a chance of an arterial fibrillation. All these cases one needs to be aware of ruling out an arteritic cause 
and so identify a giant cell arteritis with its classic presentations rule out and ask for jaw claudication temporal headache tongue necrosis these are those conditions that might progress on to things like aortic aneurysm stroke and bilateral blindness there's a classical diagnostic criteria apart from your elevated esr and c reactive protein and other features with more than six of these features needs to be met for a diagnosis of a GCA. MRI in a GCA might sometimes show involvement of a typical arteritic lesion not only in one area but also in the other contralateral eye and so therefore these need to be treated very early with systemic corticosteroids, IV methylprednisolone in order to prevent and protect blindness in the other eye. There is a role of MRI with especially diffusion weighted imaging because almost 19 to 25 percent of the arterial occlusion could show up not only presence of a typical plaque but also a kind of a silent infarction which might go undetected. So the management is about in acute cases going to try to restore perfusion, in subacute cases to prevent neovascularization and in long term to prevent ischemic damage. The conventional mode of management is all about trying to induce vasodilation. So breathing in, paper bag breathing is a very important aspect in very early presentation of carbogen inhalation which produces cerebral vasodilation and increased oxygenation. There is a role of ocular massage trying to dislodge the emboli. There is a role of systemic anticoagulation sometimes. Role of intravenous acetazolamide and mannitol and aqueous humor paracentesis if presents very early by reducing the IOP to increase perfusion pressure. In cases where the patients present beyond 6 to 9 hours, none of these have shown to have a remarkable difference in the outcome. So what leaves us is predominantly thrombolysis or intravenous TPA. There is an evidence-based study on especially in acute ischemic stroke that if a patient presents to you less than 4.5 hours, there is a role of alteplase which can be given at a specified dosage. Schrag et al. in his study showed that there is an incre possible increase in recovery from 2000 to 2200, a three-line improvement if treated within 4.5 hours. There are three different studies, thrombolytic studies, which are done on the thrombolysis trials in Europe, including those on alteplase as well as those on tenecteplase. There is a role of intra-arterial TPA by microcatheterization of the ostium, but this can sometimes be quite dangerous. So that is why the Eagle study had to be almost aborted or stopped prematurely because they found no really significant difference between the conservative group as well as the treated group. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy is a very important aspect, especially given in a claustrophobic chamber like this, wherein there is likely to be a mitochondrial, um, you know, a kind of a surplus oxygen given. And this basically involves giving 100% oxygen at atmospheric pressure of greater than 1, which typically gives to increased retinal perfusion pressure. Normally, there would be a greater than 50% oxygen supply derived from the passive diffusion, but if you were to likely to increase that to 97%, this could be a great temporizing measure done by the hyperbaric oxygen, leading to an improvement in over 55 to 75% of the cases. An important aspect is your OCT in CRAO, which might be a very important diagnostic criteria in early cases because all of them shows increased retinal thickening. This particular study by Daniel showed that if a person presented within 4.5 hours, there is a relative retinal thickness index which basically showed an increase in the retinal thickness from you know to 5% in 1.5 hours which increased to almost 40% within the 10 hours. So there is a golden hour wherein you can identify the increase in retinal thickness index and that might play a very important role in identifying these cases very early. Long term management is all about trying to prevent neovascular glaucoma and yes, beware of this COVID-19 which plays a very important role in all of the cases of CRO that we are going to see because there could be an underlying coagulopathy there. So to sum up, it's important to triage, beware of the window period, don't miss a silent stroke, there is still a role of paper bag breathing and yes, the role of TPA and hyperbaric oxygen therapy are the mainstay of treatment. Thank you.
uh, thanks venkat so you know there are some options available for uh, cr uh, ao that's what uh, you enumerated i wish we had more time to discuss uh, you know certain uh, debatable aspects of surgery for cro etc if time permits probably we can come back for that so our next talk is from dr uh, shrikant uh, he is going to talk on ocular ischemic syndrome and its management hi good morning yeah. usha yeah, can morning. you play my slides yes sir one minute this is ocular ischemic syndrome and let's morning and uh, i thank the kos organizing committee for this opportunity to be on this virtual dais today for the coscon 2021 and my topic for today is ocular ischemic syndrome and let's let me share the screen for that now get going okay here we are i hope you can see the screen okay uh, ocular ischemic syndrome is a very uncommon disease with hardly 7.5 cases per million people that we see in a year and uh, it's often missed because more than 35% of the patients are asymptomatic and uh, more than 35% of the patients have very subtle clinical signs and hence it's quite often missed and it may be misdiagnosed also because often it can be confused with central retinal vein occlusion or proliferative diabetic retinopathy and it indicates a serious systemic disease it's a vision threatening condition with severe carotid artery occlusion and ocular hypoperfusion and there could be transient or a permanent vision loss associated with ischemic ocular pain clinical setting of presentation is multiple comorbid conditions can be present in a very sick patient who has got diabetes hypertension ischemic ocular heart disease and atherosclerosis atherosclerosis being the most uh, important entity here and majority of the patients uh, are asymptomatic and that's why it's often missed and there could be mild to severe vision loss ranging from 20 by 20 vision to up to 3 by 60 but most of these patients unless prompt and early intervention is done the vision goes down to pl or no perception of light within a matter of a year if not intervened early and there could be transient uh, episodes of uh, ischemic attacks like tia of the eye uh, that may be lasting for a few seconds to a few minutes and this is commonly triggered by exposure to bright light or there is any sudden postural change or after eating a meal and many of them also have scotomata like uh, central centrocecal scotomas or paracentral scotomas and the other most common symptom that we notice in these patients is pain most of these patients have dull aching pain which is considered ocular angina which is most commonly due to ischemia severe ischemia of the uh, eye and the periorbital tissue and there can also be due to increased intraocular pressure and most of the patients will present that uh, lying down will may relieve the pain or reduce the severity of the pain clinical signs on examination these patients anterior segment will show corneal edema and diffuse uh, corneal edema with conjunctival and episcleral injection decimates folds corneoscleral melting iris atrophy and there could be uh, a rubiosus iridis in more than 50% of the patients and the fixed semi dilated pupil with ectropia on uva is a common presentation and the rubiosus iridis is also present there could be neovascular glaucoma and iridocyclitis with cells flare and keratotic prostrates and if there is cataract it could be asymmetrical with affected eye being having a severe more severe cataract the uh, the fundus shows large multiple blot hemorrhages in the periphery and mid periphery and dilated vessels uh, veins with the narrowed arteries and uh, there could be cotton wool uh, spots and cherry red spot in the retina and av communications can also be seen and there could also be a frank vitreous hemorrhage multiple neovascularization of the periphery and an nvd at the disc heart exudates are rarely seen unless there is a coexistent diabetic retinopathy commonly it is confused with crvo or diabetic retinopathy because this can be present in patients who already have crvo or a dr because 
main striking difference would be that crvo you see the uh, hemorrhages which are flame shaped along the vascular arcade and there will be tortuosity the vessels and in diabetic retinopathy there will be coexistent microaneurysms and uh, multiple of the microaneurysms and hard exudates which are not commonly seen in an ocular ischemic syndrome unless it's a very advanced stage and investigations uh, ffa will show delayed and patchy choroidal filling and they could, the delay could be up to one minute compared to normal five seconds for a choroidal filling and all phases like AV, transit time and everything else will be delayed and in advanced cases there could be microneurysms, macular edema, neovascularization seen at the disc and NVE with extensive scapulary non-perfusion areas. ICG will also be helpful in patchy showing patchy choroidal filling and delayed filling of the watershed zone. And ERG and uh, VEP can also be useful, which shows uh, reduced B wave amplitude and uh, increased latency and uh, reduced amplitude on the VEP photostress test. The main point is on clinical examination is any patient we need to keep in mind is who is older, of age, above 60 years, multiple comorbidities, who comes on a wheelchair to your clinic, recent reduction in uh, vision in one eye, dull ocular pain, and multiple other medical problems, uniocular asymmetrical disease, AC cells flare that gives us a picture of a neovascular glaucoma, elevated intraocular pressures, so very sick looking eye should be arousing high suspicion about a uh, ocular ischemic syndrome. The main systemic assessment is by carotid occlusive disease assessment, which is done by the radiologist and the neurologist team with a carotid duplex, which is a non-invasive test, which gives us information about the anatomical imaging and the flow velocities. And MR angio and CT angio are a lot more diagnostic, and uh, these are second line tests, which are minimally invasive and more than 90% sensitivity, which will show occlusion, which is most commonly just at the junction of the bifurcation of the internal and the, uh, external carotid arteries. And this is where the commonly the occlusion occurs. It could be unilateral or a bilateral occlusion. The main management, ocular management is mainly aimed at reducing the inflammation, controlling the intraocular pressure and treat the retinal ischemia. Topical steroids will break the cycle of inflammation and IOP cycloplegics to prevent iris movement and hyphema. IOP control to topical steroids and diamox is necessary. So mainly we treat it with uh, steroids, cycloplegics and uh, IOP reducing medical treatment. That is the primary first aid that we give and filtering surgery and um, MMC with MMC or a drainage device may be subsequently necessary provided the patient is medically fit enough to undergo surgery. Treatment of ischemia with anti-VEGF are useful in reducing the rubiosis and retinal neovascularization, but that is not the only definitive treatment which should be followed up with a thorough PRP laser. FFA to know the extent of ischemia and plan or laser is helpful. Rubiosis, if present, is a poor prognostic indicator and uh, uh, that may not give us good outcome after a carotid endarterectomy. Florid neovascularization response has been seen in many cases who have uh, undergone a carotid endarterectomy after a uh, diagnosis and uh, they could they could do either with a plaque ex, uh, removal or uh, doing a carotid artery stenting so main clinical pearls are ocular ischemic syndrome is often missed or misdiagnosed ois should be ruled out in a sick patient with a sick looking eye Medical and surgical treatment for the eye is challenging due to multiple comorbid conditions. So it's difficult for us to take the patient to the operation theater and do any surgical intervention. Prompt and early referral to a physician is necessary and also a team of physician and neurologists. And uh, it's, it's beyond our scope to sit and make an assessment of the extent of the carotid occlusion. It's a teamwork. And it's best for us to stabilize the eye with enough medical treatment, anti vegf or laser before the patient is taken up for a carotid surgery. Thank you. Thank you, Srikant. That's a very uh, comprehensive review of OIS. And if time permits, probably we can come back to you about uh, you know certain again debatable aspects of 
using anti-VEGF6 in uh, OAS. Can we have the next talk from uh, Dr. Uh, Kalpana? She's going to talk on Usha, can we have the next talk ready, please? It's an acquired focal aneurysmal dilatation of an arteriole. It's usually... Good morning. Today, I'll be presenting the retinal artery macroaneurysm and its management in two parts. Initial overview followed by the cases. Retinal arterial macroaneurysm, as the name suggests, it's an acquired focal aneurysmal dilatation of an arteriole. It's usually uncommon, like approximately 1 in 4,500 people it can occur, but still we come across uh, in our clinical practice quite often. So RAM typically occurs along the temporal branches and usually it occurs within the first three orders of the retinal arterial system. It often seen at the bifurcation of the AV crossing. RAM also has got a predilection for the elderly hypertensive women. The pathogenesis, if you look at uh, the changes are similar to that of arteriosclerosis and there is thickening of the arteriolar vessel wall with focal areas of ischemia and remodeling of the greater intimal collagen. The breaks can occur within the arterial wall, which results in a fusiform dilatation of the wall. It can either present uh, as a quiescent ram, so where it is only seen as an incidental finding or routine fundus evaluation and uh, no visual symptoms, and uh, or it can be an acute presentation with a rapid uh, visual deterioration as in hemorrhagic gram. So on clinical examination, one may find a saclar or fusiform dilatation along the first or uh, second order arteriole. And uh, it may be associated with a multilayered hemorrhage, uh, which may be involving the vitreous as well as all the layers of the retina. So whenever there is a hemorrhagic RAM, so diagnostic uh, challenge uh, to diagnose uh, RAM with the PCV as well as exudative AMDs. So better to examine the fellow eye, which may give a clue whether if it is associated with Drusen, uh, it could be AMDs uh, or it could be um, associated with the uh, significant hypertensive retinopathy. It may give a clue to retinal artery macro aneurysm. So it can also present as exudative RAM and uh, compared to hemorrhagic RAM, the exudative form has a more indolent course. It may be characterized by lipid deposition in a succinate pattern surrounding the lesion as well as interretinal edema with accumulation of SRF. It can also occur uh, involving the fovea, so where it may result in permanent central vision loss. The imaging options available are fundus fluorescent and angiography as well as uh, uh, endocyanin green uh, angiography, which may delineate uh, the macroaneurysm in the background uh, block fluorescent much better with ICG. OCT and APTA are uh, the non-invasive uh, diagnostic uh, modalities. It not only demonstrates the focal vascular outpouching, uh, but uh, we can also see the involution course uh, with the size of the RAM decreasing or demonstrating a lack of flow within the lesion. Ultrasonography as well as uh, uh, important uh, in cases where the fundus is not visible to extensive hemorrhage. So clinical course, it can either involve spontaneously with a favorable visual prognosis or there may be severe complications with an extensive hemorrhage and exudation. When it involves the fovea, it can give rise to severe or permanent central visual loss. Thus, management of RAM not only depends on the visual equity of the affected eye, so the location of the lesion is also important. Associated uh, consequences also should be kept in mind to choose the treatment options available. In addition to that, uh, the physician, uh, we need to refer the patient in order to control the blood pressure optimally. So various treatment options available. So in asymptomatic and non-foveal threatening grams, uh, either uh, we can observe the patient uh, and laser photocorrelation, either focal, pulse or subthreshold. Most common preference is subthreshold laser. So it can avoid uh, arterial occlusion. And uh, the laser parameters used are large spot size so that uh, macroaneurysm doesn't rupture, as well as a longer duration and a lesser power uh, laser is uh, preferred. And yellow laser is uh, better observed in this uh, hemorrhagic lesion.
The exudative ramps can also be treated with uh, anti VEGF and uh, YAG hyaluronidectomy, intravitreal gas, or TPA, and uh, vitrectomy may be the choice in case of hemorrhagic cramps. Rams can also be associated with the branched retinal vein occlusion, or there could be a multiple rams. Sometimes uh, rams can also be seen in non hypertensive patients as an arteriolitis. This is a patient uh, who was a middle aged hypertensive female uh, presented to us with sudden dimness of vision. The fund is showing a large hemorrhage along the sprotemporal arcade, uh, along with the uh, hemorrhage uh, uh, in the, involving the fovea. The white arrow points to a suspicious area of the macroaneurysm, which is confirmed with the fundus fluorescent angiogram, showing a large uh, hyperfluorescent uh, ram along the supratemporal arcade, along with block fluorescence. The patient uh, here was a 65 year old gentleman, so the rams can also be seen uh, in a male patient. So it is uh, a large uh, submacular hemorrhage uh, you can see here along with uh, some exudation uh, nasal to it. FFA and ICG was done in this patient uh, where the ICG clearly delineates the retinal arteriolar macroaneurysm uh, along the inferior branch. So the OCT shows a large amount of uh, submacular hemorrhage and a sub -ILM hemorrhage uh, with back shadowing as well. Another interesting case was uh, of Ram, which was seen in an 80 year old woman who presented to us with floaters in her right eye. And you can see in this fundus uh, there was uh, fovea was spared and the vision was normal. Here uh, we can see that uh, there are some hemorrhages and exudation along the second bifurcation of the supratemporal arterial. This patient uh, we reassured and was observed. Uh, subsequently, this hemorrhage and exudation disappeared. However, the same patient came to us again uh, subsequent to two years uh, with visual equity of uh, 20 by 60. See in the right uh, side picture where you can see the large retinal arterial uh, macroaneurysm in the proximal branch of the uh, retinal artery. And uh, here you can see in the same sector, there is block fluorescent, multiple block fluorescent corresponding to superficial hemorrhage and uh, hyperfluorescence uh, involving the macular edema, so it's up to the fovea. So this was a case of uh, RAM associated with the uh, supratemporal BRVO. And patient was treated with intravitreal injection of ranibizumab as uh, where the vision improved subsequently to 6 by 5. So patient again came back uh, in just next three months with visual loss of 2 by 200. So here uh, you see this uh, fundus uh, picture where uh, there is a large uh, premacular hemorrhage as well as some vitreous hemorrhage. Uh, so you can see here. Uh, there was a third RAM which was developed in a different branch. So this was a very interesting case, same patient, same eye, and RAM developed in different arterial branches. So this patient uh, vitrectomy was performed and the vision subsequently improved to 20 by 30. Another case uh, of a 64 year old male who presented with a four days two of new floaters and the decreased vision in the left eye. So right eye was normal. You can see the left eye fundus with a quite probable toxoplasma scar and a ruptured aneurysm with a mild hemorrhage uh, in the background. So this patient uh, had a very interesting finding of a multiple retinal arterial macroaneurysm. Unlike in the other case uh, where it developed uh, in a different branches, but here it was a simultaneous presentation of a multiple retinal arterial macroaneurysm. So this patient uh, was a, though it was a hypertensive, so the cause for aneurysm said to be because of uh, arteriolitis in this uh, patient, secondary to toxoplasmosis. So various uh, cases have also been reported in the literature where RAM was associated with even cerebral artery macroaneurysm as well. Thank you all and uh, I also thank uh, thanks, Dr. Kurpana. That was a wonderful talk. We are coming to the last uh, talk of the evening. Uh, sorry, uh, the morning, the first session. Usha, can we have uh, my talk? I'm going to speak yes. on vascular glaucoma and uh, 
though it's uh, kind of a hybrid between retina and glaucoma, I just wanted to enumerate a new, uh, not a really new, now it's been used for a couple of years, uh, the use of MP3 TSCPC in the management of uh, NVG. Good morning, everybody. I thank KOS for this opportunity, and I would like to talk on neovascular glaucoma and uh, uh, the newer way of management. So these are all the uh, causes for vascular uh, causes of neovascular glaucoma. We know the diabetic retinopathy, vein occlusions, artery occlusions, detachment, hemorrhagic retinal disorders, and a host of other diseases can cause neovascular glaucoma. Uh, these are other uh, causes like irradiation, tumors, inflammatory diseases, surgical causes, extraocular vascular disorders, all of them can cause neovascular glaucoma. And in early stages, we know the IOP can be normal with only NVI and NVA seen, and a careful gonioscopy is very important. But in later stages, uh, uh, when the IOP is elevated, uh, the disease can be very dramatic, and uh, people can present with very acute, severe pain, a headache, nausea, and vomiting. And in fact, it can be mistaken for an acute abdomen. A careful evaluation of the corneal edema and the intraocular patient will uh, reveal the diagnosis for this. So coming to the treatment of neovascular glaucoma, it is aimed at three things, lowering the intraocular pressure, treatment of associated inflammation in the form of anti vegf agents and uh, sometimes steroids, uh, and treatment of associated retinal ischemia with uh, uh, laser PRP whenever the view allows and intravitreal anti vegf agents is very important. So in that, I would like to concentrate on lowering of the intraocular pressure by the newer methods. Uh, of course, trabeculectomation devices have been used for decades uh, with a lot of success. Laser procedures like SLT, MLT has been used. And in N cases, we also do CPC and enucleation. But the newer MP3 TSCPC is something which we can use very, very effectively. I would like to acknowledge Dr. Sonal Chaya and Dr. Monjanath KP, who do a lot of micropulse TSCPC at my center. And uh, <clears throat> so, what is micropulse? Micropulse is basically where the continuous wave pulse is broken into uh, a chain of or the burst of pulses where there's on and off time. And uh, during the on time, the energy is on, whereas during the off time, the energy uh, is not there and the tissue pulls off. So this, this is the Miyake view of uh, the CPC. You can see how the photocoagulation destroys the ciliary body. And then there is photocoagulation. Compare this to uh, micropulse, where you can see only the movement of the ciliary body, but there is no destruction of the tissue. This is the laser beam, beam moving. So it is a kinder, kinder and gentler way of uh, cyclophotocoagulation. Uh, basically, it increases the US clearal outflow. There is a structural reorganization of the outflow facility uh, with the, the longitudinal serial muscle shortening, posterior and inward rotation of the scleral spur. There is a posterior movement of the trabecular mushwork, enlargement of the Schlems canal, and basically the angle also gets deepened. So this action is something similar to the pilo, uh, use of pilocarpine. And uh, once uh, the changes are set in, which can be as early as uh, even few hours to a uh, few days, uh, the US clearal flow and the conventional flow increases in these patients, where, uh, dramatically reduce the intraocular pressure. So this is again a, a demonstration where the scleral spur is moved and the ciliary body uh, contracts. So this is the machine. Uh, Cyclo G6 laser uh, system from Iridex. We don't have any commercial interest. And among the three probes, the MP3 probe is something which uh, is for single held. It's a handheld uh, RFID device for transcleral application. It's a fiber optic tip with 600 microns in diameter with a 0.4 millimeter protrusion. The energy is delivered three millimeter behind the limbus. And these are the variables that we have to keep in mind. The pulse, energy, and duration, very similar to other uh, laser procedures that we do. We do our procedures in the operation theatre with a, a consent variable by anesthesia and uh, the probe is placed just the way we are showing in this video. It is placed about 2 to 3 millimeters from the limbus. There is a gentle sweep of uh, 80 seconds which will happen across uh, the hemisphere and the same is repeated uh, in the superior quadrant also. So the total duration is close to about 160 seconds. And uh, post-op regimen is not very, very rigid. It involves only few anti-glaucoma drops, taking care of the pain and associated inflammation. So in our patients of uh, uh, 13 patients, the, where the baseline IUP was about 40, 
from day 1 to day 30 itself there was a significant drop of the intraocular pressure and the iop stabilized at around 18 to 19 we were able to salvage many many eyes and uh, uh, even the vision gets restored very fast cornea dramatically improves the rubiosis comes down because of our anti vegf agents and the iop is the the drop of iop is so dramatic that by a day 1 patient can actually see better we will buy a lot of time we can do much more uh, lasers and in few cases we may end up with trabeclectomy but the success of the trabeclectomy definitely increases so there will be medication uh, that will be reduced we can take up the uh, oral medications retreatment may be required for some patients of course and the complications are generally rare there can be vision drop because of optic atrophy vitreous hemorrhage etc rare cases of hypotony hypotony has been repeat uh, reported uat scan occur inflammation is something which can be associated so we need to uh, treat that in our series we didn't have any macular edema corneal edema which persisted or uh, pupil damage or acclimation uh, loss uh, in our series so uh, mp3 tcp survey is a very effective way to reduce the pressure especially in cases of neovascular glaucoma where the presenting pictures are extreme pain and very very high iop the results can be very dramatic and uh, can be noticed in a very very short time and we will be able to salvage many more eyes when we employ this uh, technology thank you so that was about the neovascular glaucoma and its uh, management using tscpc now i would like to uh, invite venkat and dr kalpana for their uh, uh, thoughts on uh, some of the talks that we had in the morning uh, <laughs> glad that we finished uh, our all our talks in time and we have about 5 minutes before we can hand over the session dr kalpana yeah any questions from audience Yes, madam i have a question yeah. my, my, my question is to dr bagam nadesh sir where uh, what, what is the duty cycle which you use in uh, in this mp3 tscpc a uh, 31.3 31. 31. 31.3 31. okay so Percent. that means 31% of the times it is uh, uh, the the laser is going to act and uh, this and uh, But the retinal lasers we use for retinal lasers we use a duty cycle of close to about five percent, and yes. for the glaucoma MLT procedures we generally it goes up to ten to fifteen percent, and here the duty cycle goes up to thirty one thirty one point three or something. Yeah. And in you, if you compare to the regular or the routine DSCPC which we do, uh, uh, what are the advantages in terms of reduction of the complications which you have with the regular DSCPC? yeah the tscpc what we used to do before you know where we would hear a pop where there is a tissue destruction uh, that was a uh, untitrated procedure probably i could call uh, you know i have done quite a lot of tscpc myself i would get a very variable results post op and it was never dramatic you know by day 1 day 2 the eyes were extremely congested painful and the amount of eyes that we could say was uh, difficult and the subsequent trabeclectomies used to be uh, very very uh, difficult to do whereas with this uh, the eye looks uh, kind of untouched and uh, we have a very very graded uh, decrease in the uh, though dramatic by day 1 uh, it is a much more i would say uh, you know predictive way of reducing the intraocular pressure there is hardly any tissue tissue destruction very minimal hypotonies that we saw and very hardly any cases go into thysis but with tscpc i have seen myself uh, some of my own cases went into thysis in 2 to 3 months time <clears throat> and then you know we had to do only one quadrant and only half the uh, hemisphere you know those are the things that we brought in with tscpc but we don't have those kind of headaches and we can we we have started to do it for poeg cases now with 6669 vision with a extremely predictable uh, response so we do 360 degrees uh, with microbes yeah, yeah we do 360 degrees and in those cases where we are doing it for a secondary procedure for example after a bleb or uh, after a, a buccal procedure where some of the areas where conjunctiva is not accessible you can spare those areas and of course we spare the 3 o'clock and the 9 o'clock meridian and you can cover all the other areas fantastic procedures yeah i think this is something which all retinologists should start using and uh, we will be able to uh, you know uh, save many more eyes and patients are generally within a days time they are much more comfortable and uh, uh, you know we can they they regain cornea clarity and uh, the inflammation also is extremely less 
And do you always need the 810 nanometer wavelength or you can do with the regular what we use with the 577 which we have in retina cameras? Now with the 577, we can do the retina and the MLT. But uh, for the TSCPC, we need the 810. I don't think we get the same penetration with 577. Uh, I think like any other questions from any other audience and uh, on uh, any other sir, topics? Uh, uh, I had a question again to Bhargav, sir. Right. Yeah. Sir, uh, is this is this uh, uh, the duty cycle? Is it variable on this, or it is a fixed duty cycle that the console comes with? Uh, it is variable. We can set the duty cycle at different uh, different levels. So the same equipment can also be used in retinal treatment as well, sir, or it is uh, this is exclusive no, no, the for the uh, Of course, they are very smart. You know, the console is different. It's a totally different machine. Uh, so what the laser machine that we use for our PRP. So that's a 577 uh, uh, micron uh, uh, console. So that we cannot use it for the TSCPC. For the TSCPC, we have to use the 810 uh, console. But 810 uh, micropulse is also possible. No, uh, micropulse we, is possible. So they haven't given that facility in this console. They have not, not given that facility actually. Okay. okay. What Karthik is probably saying is that when you have a, a CSCR kind of lesions where you want to go yeah. slightly deeper, but with the micropulse, I think the 810 uh, may be useful. and if the if the company is giving a combination of doing the glaucoma and the retinal procedures together with this 810 nanometer that will be fantastic correct true absolutely yeah so that comes to 1030 and uh, uh, dr kalpana can we have closing remarks by you yeah all the talks were uh, very good from all the speakers and uh, highly contributory but uh, uh, one of the uh, topic like uh, what uh, Dr. Sanjay was speaking of. Is he around? I just had one small question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Sanjay. So like uh, post-COVID, uh, all uh, uh, vascular occlusions and vascular involvement you are saying, I just wanted to know like for how long you are going to consider that as post-COVID? So it's, some cases were two months and some cases could be much later. So how are we so much sure that it is only because of the COVID? So there are so many other risk factors also. Were you really able to differentiate whether it was because of COVID as such, except in some cases where you had some D-dimer increase and other things. But otherwise, uh, we are going to conclude that it is uh, basically because of uh, yeah, so basically it is a million dollar question to prove it is uh, COVID. So this is uh, what I explained the fallacy. So did it happen because of COVID or uh, is it something else? So ideally what we have to do is uh, rule out our usual uh, occlusions, uh, the causes of occlusions. If you have ruled out everything, uh, what we are taking is a cutoff of about three months. Again, it is arbitrary. Uh, we cannot say for sure. But the key indicators that it could be probably due to COVID are the systemic markers like D-dimer, serum ferritin, uh, LDH, and uh, prothrombin time. So these are the uh, prothrombin time and the activated pro, uh, partial thromboplastin time. If these factors are increased, possibly we can say that it is a sequelae of uh, COVID after yeah, having ruled out uh, other causes. Yeah, see, as in we also had a similar study, but what we have seen only in mild and moderate cases. So only thing is none of these enzymes were increased. But how many of your cases had enzyme increase? So uh, like only in severe cases, yeah, I think we can cut. We have already have. You have taken two minutes more. I think... Yeah. Uh, so I thank all the speakers, uh, chairperson and co-chair, uh, Dr. Venkat, and uh, uh, over, we'll hand over the session to the next group. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you.